modifications, if necessary, to IDSA and ESU guidelines for us, our patients in Asia. Uh, and first and foremost, uh, the most important slide for me, the acknowledgement slide, as well as my conflict of interest. And to start off, we always ask ourselves, you know, what are the purpose of uh, you know, guidelines, especially guidelines that's written by so-called uh, international experts? So in, in short, what I see why these guidelines exist as they are is that they, they, they help to keep us updated with a summary of the current evidence that's available for treatment of diseases to perhaps enable us to standardize our care, to standardize workflow, and of course, unfortunately for hospital administrators, some people use these as uh, quality indicators and performance indices. And, but of course, we must not forget too that these are actually formed with the intent to help us improve our practice and hopefully to improve outcomes of our patient. Of course, however, these guidelines, you know, as up-to-date as they are, do come with certain caveats. Number one is, uh, especially in the context of invasive fungal diseases, there are actually not many randomized trials as compared to what you see in therapeutics, for instance, in bacterial infections. And number two, in the context of IFDs, most of the patient cohorts are invariably extremely complex in the medical background. And number three, that the recommendations generally pertain to the more common IFDs like aspergillosis, candidemia. Furthermore, we must be aware too that these guidelines, no matter how detailed they are, are usually general because they, we must be aware too that there may be specific special scenarios that are actually faced in our country and our healthcare institutions which are different from that described in the West, be it in Europe or in US. And these do not take into consideration deviations from the health situations in our particular institution. And likewise, they do not take into account things that can go wrong, for instance, with patient cohorts, patients who don't tolerate medications. And there's, of course, an uh, additional clause in many of these guidelines saying, you know, these are merely here to guide, you know, don't take them as wholesale, you know, do as it is necessary and to modify as is per necessary. So the available IFD guidelines to this date uh, know, pertains to you know, the specific bugs. Some do, some don't differ or concur on the patient cohorts whereby they are going to be applied to. Of course, to, to in greater details within these patient cohorts, what kind of patients they are, you know, what kind of chemotherapy, Protocol, uh, transplant protocols they, that they may be subject to, and as such, through the degree of immunosuppression, what are the diagnostic approaches that's available pertaining to the utilization of these guidelines, and as well as the different treatment strategies. And I'm going to bring you run you through some of these updated guidelines, international guidelines, and how they in turn actually influence our real life practice in Asia. And guidelines are abound, you could name it, you have it from all corners of the world, you know, from Europe, US, some from within our Asia Pacific region. So we are basically pretty much you know, bombarded and surrounded by these guidelines. But you know, which are the ones that you know, in our practice actually are pretty much close to our uh, practice and uh, relevance to what we do in our daily life. So I'm going to go off first, start off first by reviewing the guidelines that's currently in place for invasive candidiasis. So just to run us through the ASMIC guidelines uh, with the, uh, the strengths as well as the recommendations as well as the quality of the evidence. As you know too, IDSA now uses the great guidelines which in my opinion is actually even more, makes things even more complex which we'll talk about later on. And here this actually summarizes, uh, it's an extract of the old IDSA guideline last written in 2009 for candidemia and how the guidelines were until they were very recently shaped by both ESIL as well as IDSA in 2016. And what you would see here in the, the, in the old guidelines then is that there's actually, the most important thing that I would like to highlight is actually the role of the corners out between the SMIT as well as the IDSA guidelines then and now. And of course by then, uh, there was already consensus that the echinocandins were actually uh, the drug of choice in the treatment of candidemia. Fluconazole was actually seen as basically a, a difference between the IDSA as well as the ESMIT guidelines then because, of the, because by then, the ESMIT guidelines had actually taken into account the Riboli paper that we'll talk about later on. And subsequently, which we'll see that there was not much of a difference in the opinion 
in the usage of ambisome as well as amphotar uh, as well as uh, voriconazole. But you can see here, up till 2009, there was still actually provision for use of uh, amphotericin B deoxycholate by the IDSA folks. Now, of course, the paper that changed uh, the way in which many of us think in terms of the difference in efficacy between uh, fluconazole and the echinocandines came about by the Raboli paper, which came out in New England. As likewise, the subsequent reviews that came about looking at the usage of azole as well as the echinocandines, whereby there was actually a suggestion that fluconazole was actually superior or was inferior to, uh, to, uh, to aphotericin as well as the echinocandines as represented by angular flangin here. So the authors actually concluded that uh, you know, in this context, in the context of a meta-analysis, that the canocandins and ambisome, sorry, were actually pre the preferred first-line treatment, you know, and uh, this was further supported by further, hold on, where is it? Patient-level uh, patient data from David Andes, which further again reinforced the opinion across the globe that the factors that were associated with improved outcomes in terms of survival was that of the use of echinocandins as well as the removal of catheters, as you have heard about. So as such, in lieu of this new data that came about in the subsequent years after the publication of the last guidelines, IDSA actually revised its uh, guidelines in 2016, where it has actually made a switch in recommendation, whereby they now recommend that echinocandin as number one in choice. However, they have still made a provision in the clause saying that fluconazole is an alternative in patients who are actually not critically ill or who are not likely to have a azole resistant candida in the context of the general patient cohort who have got candidemia. And as such, this is actually the just updated guidelines comparing ESMIT as well as ISU as well as the IDSA guidelines for candidemia in particular for patients who are non-neutropenic, by the first line here, it's recommended to be the echinocandins, and the fluconazole here has been put at actually a C1 grade. And for IDSA now, you have, you have this more complicated uh, grades of recommendation where it is SR is a strong recommendation as well as a high quality evidence saying that uh, it can be used in a sp specific context with, uh, uh, with, with exceptions. And here, you can see now that uh, by 2016, the IDSA has now recommended that the amphotericin b to be you know, not to be used or to be advised against usage by both the IDSA, not just IDSA, but also by ASMIT. Okay, so how about the hematologic cohort? Okay, so similarly, the guidelines saw some modifications uh, uh, in 2016, and this is what it used to be. Okay, I can see here still, echinocandins are the drug of choice as recommended by both ESIL, the early ESIL version, and the old IDSA 2009 uh, guidelines. And versus the use of amphotericin B, which is actually recommended with high grades of evidence by both bodies. So what are the recommendations, the latest recommendations in the 2016 guidelines by uh, the IDSA? whereby now they say that the echinocandins are still the drug of choice. Again, fluconazole, there is actually a clause saying that you can use in those that are not critically ill, who have got no prior azole exposure, which again, in patients who have got uh, neutropenic, aka patients with cancer, quite a number of them do actually have already had hep sun azole exposure. Now, of course, there are also clauses uh, permitting the use of voriconazole where you want some more coverage. So as you would notice from the recommendations to date, the rec quality of evidence for the cancer, the hematological patients, the level of evidence is actually pretty much weaker than that of the overall patient cohort for a very simple reason is that many are actually the findings and the quality of evidence is actually e extrapolated from candidemia patients of which hematologic patients actually constitute just a small fraction. And that is why that quality of evidence is usually one grade lower than that of the overall patient cohort with candidemia. And now this stance is the start current latest uh, guidelines comparing 
patients as per recommended by IDSA and ESIL, six uh, currently on the, uh, the guidelines for treatment of candidemia in the neutropenic cord. As you can see here too, it's still echinocandins, fluconazole, though now they have downgraded it in view of the recent evidence they have a weak recommendation, low quality of evidence, as well as, well, you can see that ESIL actually it feels much strongly, more strongly against the use of fluconazole in most contexts. That's why they actually put it as the C3 recommendation. Okay, there is still a role for ambisole. Of course, patients do afford it. And likewise, uh, some people do think that voriconazole can be used if there is actually a need for additional more cover. And again, you can see the clause here whereby IDS is actually completely removed the recommendation for deoxycholate, while ESIL actually put a C Two, which is actually uh, strongly advised against. So, so these are actually guidelines from the West. So how does this pertain to our practice and, uh, in Asia? Now, of course, too, you know, as I uh, talked about earlier on, knowing what we do in our part of the world, what is the epidemiology, as you have heard of again, from the earlier speakers about the slight difference, or you say the, you know, the slight difference in presentation, epidemiology of our candida cases, uh, where there is, of course here you have heard about the increased incidence of tropicalis, and actually the slight, relative lower likely uh, incidence of glabrata as compared to the Western institutions. And for us uh, in Asia, the, the issue of costs can't be overemphasized. And of course, uh, here I'm just using uh, X as a representation of the relative cost that you can see with the various uh, antifungal agents, where you can see that casfungin is basically five times more than uh, expensive than uh, fluconazole, and likewise uh, voriconazole, which I'm sure is uh, almost a similar situation in your country. And so, this was, this was actually in 2010. So this was actually a paper that a recommendation that we made and together with uh, David Denning on the treatment of uh, in particular Candida tropicalis. And I remember that for this paper, uh, David was shocked when I pushed for amphotericin B deoxycholate to be included in the guidelines because see this is actually the 2010 which is you know, not too long ago and by then most international bodies had already uh, advised against. But I, I think we, we have to remind, remember ourselves being very mindful too that, you know, from our perspective where cost is a great concern, you know, we, we have to stand out and say, you know, this, this is unfortunately how it is happening in real life. So that's why we had actually pushed for this to be left uh, on the recommendation list. And likewise too, despite all the moves towards uh, you know, echinocandins, uh, that was, you know, in fact, in our local guidelines, which again probably needs to be updated, we have actually still pushed for the use of a fluconazole as a first uh, line of treatment for the above mentioned reasons. I think it's more from the practical point of view. But having said this, you know, I think many of us uh, remain pretty much tied down to the patient in front of us. You know, the, 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 the amount that you have to pay when you use an echinocandin and the direct calls involved. But of course, little sometimes do we think ahead as to what happens, for instance, if you use a uh, B or a fluconazole and then you end up having a patient who you know, turns out to have a resistance and then you have complications, extended hospital stay, etc. So, you know, in, in the long run, you know, if you actually put all of these uh, factors beyond just the direct cause of treatment, into, a, into a, you know, a decision tree like this, whereby you list out the various scenario whereby, of course, the best case scenario is the patient do well, is a cheap agent, goes home happily, you know, nothing, everyone is happy. But of course, you can also have a scenario whereby the patients don't do well on the azole, ends up having to stay longer in the hospital, running into complications, ICU, etc. And you actually add up the cost and of each simulated scenario. Now, of course, this is what many people are doing now, including Prof Chen, whereby this paper is already from, where you, know, you actually put this into a cost effectiveness analysis, which, and, and you, you look at things from a systems level, whether or not you know, a single drug, for, it, for instance, be it like kinocandin or azole, 
makes a difference in terms of cost effectiveness to your health system. And uh, what Prof Chen has shown actually in the context of candidemia, of uh, echinocanding versus fluconazole, is that if you put all these factors together, it may turn out that actually your echinocanding, as expensive as it is right at the word go, well, it may it has actually save more lives, okay, and it's actually cost effective. So, of course, these are now the, the, the practices that many authorities, health authorities around the world actually adopt to make a decision as to whether or not a certain drug ought to be brought into the market, number one, and number two, to be perhaps be in the health system, to be in a formulary, and to be dispensed. Okay, so something that to, to look into this, you know, on top of just the direct cost of that single medication. So I'm going to move into this, but I, I just realized after submitting the slides that uh, there's going to be a talk tomorrow on a similar scope, so I'm going to be very fast. Okay, so the issues of uh, mole prophylaxis, uh, you know, uh, some, just some thoughts that uh, you know, I'd like to share with you in terms of uh, relative efficacy, again, in the context of practice where we are in Asia, okay, the background species, safety, and what kind of patients uh, we ought to be uh, you know, giving prophylaxis to. And the question that we always ask ourselves is, you know, again, in our patients who are Asians, are we anywhere different from those where the guidelines are actually extrapolated from in the West? Okay, this slide is complicated. Okay, it's uh, meant to be so because I've tried to put everything that we have uh, in terms of literature into one, well, one and a half tables. So the antifungal prophylaxis guidelines, again, originate primarily from ESIL, ESIL-6 now as well as versus IDSA 2016, which just again came about together around the same time as the candidemia guidelines. And of course, you'll see here that the major guidance in the context of patients who are undergoing AML induction, uh, postoconazole originating from the New England study by uh, Olivia Corneli remains the, the strongest evidence-based uh, recommendation you can see here. The Europeans and the Americans have differing opinion on the use of aerosolized ambisome. And of course, I think they are against it because the Americans are against it because this study came out from, actually from Netherlands, from Europe. But the Europeans believe in it. So the Europeans give it a B1, whereas the Americans say it is a weak recommendation with a low evidence, quality of evidence, you can see here. And then for many of us who are actually still, you know, in this part of the world, well, we still use fluconazole in our prophylaxis. And so it's still B1 because there are indeed uh, earlier studies that support its efficacy. And these, of course, are the supporting studies here as listed. And there are also provisions for use of ITRA, CASPO. I have to highlight here, though, that at this point in time, I made a red asterisk, uh, a hex sign between the two, because whereas ESIL made the effort to actually start stratify these patients according to the type of therapeutics or the chemo regimens that the patients undergo, IDSA basically lumped these two together, you know, to just say that uh, these are recommendations in general for patients with prolonged neutropenia who are at risk of IA. All right, so, so I have to apologize here that there is some confusion if there's any with regards to these recommendations because actually the two guidelines actually did have an overlap, but at the same time, there is also a dispersion between the patient cohorts that's being discussed. So for patients who have got LOSCT but without GBHD but are neutropenic, uh, this is something that's quite familiar with us. We still use fluconazole, many of us, for antifungal prophylaxis because it's well supported by good data, or Vori by the Wingard paper in Guard in Blood, or the Marx paper in British Journal of Hematology, and likewise, you know, some, other, some of the other options that you have. You can see here in this context, you will be well aware too that postoconazole has not been tested in this specific patient cohort. Okay, but in the context of LOSDT with GVHD is different, well supported by the, the Omen paper, Andrew Omen in New England in 2007 with a strong backing evidence supported by both bodies. And voriconazole is B1, and of course a little bit let down by the Wingard paper which just barely showed significance in the efficacy of voriconazole. And, but still given a pretty good rating, it's key, a strong evidence, high level of evidence which the Europeans didn't believe because it's an American paper. And then ITRA, and in this context, most people say that, well, you think against using fluconazole. So the additional issues that we consider for patients who are on prophylaxis, you know, besides the patient cohort, uh, 
the efficacy, the drug usage, of course, a lot of it is cost and safety, which is why they are in capital letter, as well as drug interactions. So these are things that I'm just going to bring about and bring you through very quickly, not just in the context of prophylaxis, but also in the context of antifungal treatment, especially with azole use. So the patient cohort to prophylax against, uh, the European data shows that you, uh, they are most concerned with AML patients and patients who are LOSDT. But in our patient cohort, the bigger, the, the, the third cohort that are actually at highest risk of uh, invasive fungal are actually the ALL patients. So, it, which is not a routine practice that, uh, that the Europeans give. But of course, in the context of our practice, we see, we see a lot of patients receiving hyper CVAT, which basically consists of high dose vin, uh, vincristine cyclophosphonide and DEX. And these are the patients whom we think, with the combination of all the three drugs, especially in the A cycle over the B cycle, the patients are actually at a uh, higher risk of uh, IFD. So if, well, the other things that you need aware of is that before you even jump in and adopt the Connelly or the woman paper in prophylaxis, you have to ask yourself this question. Do I even have IFD to treat in my institution? Okay, so if the base incidence of IFD in your institution is actually very low, then there's no point prophylaxing because there's nothing to prophylax. So just, you know, these are the questions that we go through our mind when we read a paper and see whether or not they are actually pertinent in our practice and whether or not, if so, we should implement. So of course, the Uman paper, the Connelly paper, actually you know, made a very strong case for uh, uh, prophylaxing, whereby they said that in the context of their institutions, their incidents, the number needed to treat was actually 20. But so to highlight this, the number needed to treat is so dependent on the event rate. So if you have got 10% rate of IFD in your immunosuppressed cohort, then the NNT may actually be 20. But if you only have got 2% of your AMLs and your LOSDTs, which actually have go on to have IFDs for any particular reason, that you know, some institutions do have this low rate, then your NNT actually goes up to, to 100. So if that's the case, you know, if you are going to prophylax 100 patients in your institution to just uh, have, uh, no, to, 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 to achieve a reduction of event rate of 2%, then it may not be worth the cost. Okay, so think about it. Well, this is what I just said. So, of course, the other question that's close to our hearts is actually the duration of prophylaxis because most studies or clinical trials to date have actually had the luxury of giving extended duration because they are sponsored by farmers. Okay, be it three months, or of course, for some, like many of us here, for more practical reasons, we actually prophylax until the count recovery. And for us, in our cost-effective model for cost, uh, model for azole prophylaxis, we are actually just catered for a prophylaxis of just three weeks, much, much shorter than what the Europeans and Americans do. And when we did this cost-effective analysis for patients who are on azole prophylaxis, we found that actually in the setting of you know, the healthcare system in Singapore, and I think should not be too different from you know, Malaysia, that we actually found that a POSA and ITRA suspension actually, in fact, you know, taking into consideration all the permutations of what happens to our patients when they do well or they don't, when they are put on one drug versus the other drug. We found that actually, if you put everything together, POSA and ITRA suspension are in fact more cost-effective than fluconazole, well above just the simple dollar and cents that you put in. And these are, of course, numbers that administrators like to crunch or you like to show the administrators to justify your cost for a particular drug. Uh, the next issue is that actually drug interaction. This pertains most in the context of uh, the azoles that we are talking about. And uh, well, the, the side effects here are quite well familiar to all of us. And uh, at the end of the day, when we want to start the drug, and a drug with a certain therapeutic window with a propensity for interaction, likewise to in relation of side effects to drug levels, the question we always ask ourselves you know, before we embark is that do we actually have the capacity to effectively monitor the drug level in our patients? So I'm, not, I'm next going to go into the recommendations, international recommendations for treatment of uh, invasive fungal, uh, invasive aspergillosis. In the latest guidelines from ECU-6 and IDSA, the, the most significant findings besides that of which is already a well-established fact all around the world, is the new addition of isobuconazole 
uh, into the guidelines as a first choice therapeutic option, which I'm sure you'll hear about from the next uh, speaker. Likewise, ambisome still remains on the list. Um, again, you see here the move is actually against uh, M4B deoxycholate uh, from in the latest guidelines. Also, have uh, actually made a stand to say that they were not terribly impressed by Kieran Ma's uh, combination study of, uh, of voriconazole and uh, anigula fungin, where the data had to be, uh, I was sure of using the word manipulated, had to be re looked at post hoc to gain statistical analysis in the GM positive cohort. So they actually put this as uh, the combination as actually not uh, a recommended first line treatment, but can be used when you are desperate and you, when you have the money. All right. So this was the paper by Johan that actually uh, became accepted as the grade one evidence. And the the thing now to take a seat backwards now that we are talk about drugs and treatment is to take a seat backwards to ask ourselves about the way in which we want to manage and inve investigate our patients who are at risk of IFD because this in turn affects our usage of the respective drugs, antifungal drugs that's available in our armamentarium. You have heard already that the two major approaches are that of the empiric approach versus that of the diagnostic driven or preemptive uh, treatment. So the empiric approach is actually uh, adopted in when the capacity to investigate in our institution is limited. And I wonder, because there's no point talking about all the you know, high-flying, high-flown, uh, you know, top-of-the-range uh, antifungal when perhaps we have, in our setting, have limitations in, in investigation. So, you know, which, which kind of, you know, we, we, we try to work within limitations. So this is one approach that actually is still in practice where we start treatment based on the presumption of the presence of antifungal and the trigger may just be fever in our patients, but you know, our hands are tight because we don't have you know, round-the-clock round the CT scan or round-the-clock uh, bronchoalveolar lavage. So this is a, approach is actually still adopted by many centers in Asia. And we are no, under no illusions. Versus the diagnostic driven, which I have to say is only in a center that's at a tertiary setting where you have got services you know, at the click of the fingertips where the trigger may actually be a fever, but you're able to further investigate the fever. In terms of primary complaints, you have got a lab support with a quick turnaround, whereby you're able to do galactobanum, maybe not once a week, but even once every few days, or not once a month, okay, because it's useless to have any of these when the turnaround is a fortnight, or you have got a CT scan and a BAL on demand. And so I can't emphasize the word that the turnaround for these investigations have to be prompt, if not, is as good as going to doing empiric, uh, using the empiric approach. And the reason why so is because if you are adopting an empiric therapy, then you're actually you know, faced with using these medications here, and of course, amphotericin BD oscillate, when you're unable to delineate the etiology as well as the specific mark. Whereas for some of us, we are you know, a little bit more fortunate you know, with the available resources we actually have managed in the recent years to actually shift our approach from empiric to the diagnostic-driven approach, which you have read about all you know, in the literature in the recent few years. And as such, too, this is also a testament to that, that we actually have been using less of amphotericin B deoxycholate. In fact, we hardly use nowadays because we, we are quite confident that we are able to reach a diagnosis for many of our patients. So, you know, what is your threshold for accepting the use of one drug versus the other? You know, we all know that all patients, irregardless of what drugs we use, will have some form of intolerance, side effects. So to what is our threshold that we allow ourselves to use amphotericin B deoxycholate in Asia, in our setting? Mindful too that, you know, as terrible as they sound, they do have these, uh, you know, hematologic nephroto, uh, you know, renal, blood, liver, infusional related this, uh, uh, reactions as compared to patients who are on either the echinocandins or on the azoles. And so we look at our patients uh, in our institution, you can see that actually the, well, almost all of them actually run into problems with potassium, magnesium, okay, and uh, up to about a third of uh, the patients actually run into problems with doubling of creatinine. But having said that, um, 
one thing we noticed too is that, I'm sure you guys have noticed it, is that for patients who are on uh, deoxycholate, when you take them off, quite invariably the renal function actually improves for the majority of them. So it may not be that bad. Okay, it's IRR can't be helped, you know, run slow over a long period of time, pre meds So, you know, so what is our threshold for, uh, for, for, for continuing the use of uh, deoxycholate versus, you know, other options which are available, which may actually turn out to be less uh, uncomfortable for the patient. <laughs> Likewise, uh, the use of uh, azoles, not without exceptions, in our context whereby there is probably a variation in how azoles are actually metabolized in our patients in Asia and azol interaction which you are well familiar with. And um, for those uh, patients for whom we have actually genotype, we found that the metabolism of azoles by the cytochromes are actually pretty much different from the Europeans. What we have found out is that Chinese and the Malays actually are weaker metabolizers of azoles as compared to the Indians who actually behave more like Europeans. Which means too that perhaps uh, sometimes you will run into problems with drug levels if you are using uh, voriconazole or POSA. And for, for me, myself, I've actually stopped uh, loading uh, voriconazole in my patients. Uh, you know, the dose whereby they will say you give 6644. No, I just give four all the way through. And I don't give the, if I'm doing oral, I don't give 300, 300. I just give 200 all the way through because the guys who start on 300, 300 end up having problems uh, right at the beginning of therapy. Okay, so this is going to be uh, the second last slide. So we can always give reasons, you know, why, why I do this, why follow, why not follow. So some of the reasons I can think of why we actually do deviate from you know, the practice, the so-called international Western practice is that we think we are dealing with uh, more practical situations, whereas many of these international guidelines are actually extrapolated by very strictly controlled clinical trials. We're actually doing a real life setting whereby the patient is sitting at a bedside in front of you, to, you, know, you, you know that not one size fits all. There are differences, of course, in epidemiology and resistance patterns, and we have heard of all, by all the lecturers. Different patient demographics, perhaps. Well, most important here is actually the dollars and cents. And of course, the, uh, the thing that we always say is that we know best, we doctors know best. So, you know, this is a patient, it's not a, a clinical trial. You know, I have to cater the patient according to what the patient requires. So I'm going to end off actually with a quote from Livio Pagano uh, to you know, what uh, he shares, why, uh, why there's guidelines and why we do things differently. So what he says is that there are many reasons why we deviate from these guidelines. You know, some of these recommendations may not constitute the best choice for our own patient who's in front of us. And likewise, uh, he says here that the patient's clinical conditions and comorbidities vary widely. And then thus perhaps sometimes, you know, a recommended drug may not be applicable. All right. And with this, I'm going to end my first talk and uh, be happy to welcome questions later. Thank you.